Welcome and thank you for joining our conversation today. It's about the economic and security dimensions of protecting LGBT people everywhere. My name is Michael Guest and I advise the Council for Global Equality. Those of you that don't know the Council, we are a coalition of 30 human rights and LGBT advocacy organizations. And we're really proud to have partnered with CSIS in putting this event together today. CSIS is, of course, Washington's premier strategic policy research organization. Our thanks go to Shannon Green, Julie Snyder in the back for pulling this together, and your entire Human Rights Initiative team. Uh, and pulling this together is not just the hosting. They've been involved in thinking through the concepts that we'll be discussing today. Want to thank also the Embassy of the Netherlands. I think someone is here from the Dutch Embassy. Thank you for sponsoring the event, and thanks also to the embassies of Finland and Uruguay. Uh, both of those embassies organized some roundtable conversations that very much fed into the thinking behind today's event, and we'll talk more about those uh, roundtables later. So let me just say a few words about what we want to achieve today. Today is the International Day Against Homophobia and Transphobia, as you know. Uh, it's more commonly called IDAHOT, more simply called IDAHOT. And it's a day to remind us of the uh, horrible transgressions against LGBT populations around the world that still exist today. So over the past decade, uh, the United States has made, I think, a remarkable transformation in how it treats its own LGBT people and how it incorporates LGBT issues and its human rights work abroad. And many of the people in this room have been part of that transformation. So you know what I'm talking about. And when you and I speak of LGBT inclusion, we think of it in terms of human rights. We embrace the term human rights. And we know very much that good governance um, really requires the inclusion of all societies, all portions of society. We know that inclusive communities are stronger, more cohesive than communities that are founded on privilege and division. And we reject the notion that American security and economic interest really have to be carried out at the expense of freedoms and human rights. But not everyone in the world sees this issue that way. And so today's conversation is about turning the Rubik's Cube a little bit. We want to talk about LGBT inclusion less from the standpoint of their rights than our needs and what's important to America. We want to show how impactful economic and development policies really do require the inclusion of LGBT communities. And we intend to explore why LGBT inclusion is essential to our country's national security interests, and in fact, global community interests. So we're gonna to get to that part of the conversation in the third segment of today's program. At that point, Shannon will introduce her discussants. Before that, we're gonna hear from two courageous LGBT advocates uh, from Kenya and El Salvador about how America's inclusion of LGBT issues in our human rights advocacy has impacted their lives, has impacted their communities and their countries. But first, I want to welcome our keynote speaker. Uh, it's someone that I think is uniquely positioned, perhaps, to offer us a baseline understanding of what has changed in the last eight years as LGBT issues have come to the forefront in policy. And he'll also offer some reflections about what it means uh, and maybe some ideas about what still needs to be done. Uh, if you Google the name Jake Sullivan, you'll come up rapidly with the definition of the ultimate Washington policy geek. <laughs> Jake has uh, clerked under Supreme Court Justice um, Stephen Breyer he served as policy planning director at State Department under Hillary Clinton. He served as national security advisor to Vice President Biden. Uh, he, of course, worked as policy director for the Hillary Clinton campaign for president. He's now a lecturer at Yale Law School. All of those elements of what I would call a slacker's bio. Um, Jake is just fantastic, and what Google will not tell you is the innovation and the insight he's brought into each of those positions. Google also will not tell you that he's been present at the creation, so to speak, as LGBT rights really were woven, warp, and weft into our foreign policy priorities and programs overseas. So I would like to ask you to join me, not just in welcoming Jake, 
but in thanking him for standing so clearly, consistently, and meaningfully for LGBT inclusion worldwide. Jake Sullivan. Thank you, Michael, and, and, and thank you everyone for being here today. Um, I just wanna say, Michael, before I uh, continue, uh, that it's just important to acknowledge the role that you've played in, in so many different ways at different uh, points in your career and advancing the issues that, that we're here to talk about today. Uh, Michael was the, the first openly gay ambassador to be confirmed by the Senate. He resigned in protest of State Department policies and then came to work in the Obama transition to advise on how the new administration could change those policies. And then, of course, the advocacy work that you continue to do today. And Shannon Green, thank you for leading the human rights program here at CSIS and for finding the intersections, the connections between the broader set of security and development issues and these crucial questions of human rights, uh, including LGBT rights. Uh, and Mark and Julie from CGE, thank you for all of the work that, that you do as well. You know, um, Michael mentioned that today is Idahot. Um, it's a particularly good day uh, to come together, to hear from courageous activists, to reflect on these issues. Uh, but we're also in the midst of some very interesting times uh, here in Washington, uh, where a lot of the fundamental assumptions that all of us have brought to bear about who we are as a country, what we stand for, how values play into our foreign policy are up for debate in a way that they haven't been for a very long time. And so I think part of the goal today has to be to think not just about how we talk to and support each other and learn from each other, but also how we carry this message out to a public that is questioning anew what it is that the United States does in the world and is hearing voices, including from the Oval Office, that suggests that maybe it's just not worth it, and, and frankly from the top of the State Department as well, to deal with all that value stuff that really we should just be looking out for some core interests and not much more than that. And so that's the context in which uh, we carry out this conversation today. I've been told it's my job to kick off and frame the morning's discussions. I know there's a lot of experts in this room, a lot of people who have struggled and sacrificed and thought these things through uh, and there'll be an opportunity to dig into specifics later on, so I'm gonna keep my comments uh, at a 30,000 foot level. At the outset, I wanna share a personal reflection. I was privileged to be part of the small group of people that worked with Secretary Clinton on her Geneva speech five and a half years ago. Um, we arrived in Geneva a day before the speech, and along with her speechwriter, Megan Rooney, and Dan Baer, who was a Deputy Assistant Secretary and the Democracy Rights and Labor Bureau at the time, we basically pulled an all-nighter um, and uh, went over every line, every word. This speech had been months in the making, but Secretary Clinton read a draft of it the day before and said, it can be better, let's get it right. You know, and so we, we spent that entire night going through the speech, looking for more examples, looking for ways of phrasing things that could really grab hold of people. Uh, and you know, when we got done with it the next morning, as all of you know, when you work on a project for a long time, you start getting closer and closer to it, and then you sort of, it becomes a little bit unrecognizable to you, and you don't know quite how it's gonna actually come off, how it's gonna play in public. And we showed up at a giant hall in Geneva where all of the ambassadors uh, from 190 countries had been invited uh, from the Human Rights Commission, from other of the international bodies in Geneva, there was a thousand people there, and right at that moment, you saw, this is real, this is actually going to happen. Um, but I don't think that I could have predicted the way that I would feel about 40 minutes later when she finished. Uh, you know, people stood up, gave a standing ovation at the end, and I looked around, and I just remember hugging a colleague and, colleague and saying, this was a good day, this is a good day, for the United States, this was a good day for the world, this is a good day for progress. And it was a good day not because it was a good speech, it was a good day because the speech did something important. It took this issue uh, of LGBT rights, put it in very human terms and put it front and center in a hollow diplomatic forum in Geneva 
and took a conversation that had largely happened behind the scenes and said, no, we are now going to make this a core central priority of American human rights work from this point forward. And to feel the momentum that began building as she finished her speech and as we carried forward, it was a great privilege for me to be able to do that. You know, serving in government can be very frustrating, so you savor the wins and the good days you, when you can get them, and that was one of them. So with the remainder of my remarks, I want to talk about two things. First, what we did in the Obama administration to try to integrate LGBT human rights into our foreign policy, and second, how we might go about making the case to folks on both sides of the aisle for continued U.S. leadership on human rights, including LGBT human rights, as an important national security priority. President Obama and Secretary Clinton came to office in 2009 committed to this issue, committed to advancing the equal rights of LGBT people in both our domestic and foreign policy. Vice President Biden was passionate about this as well. Some of you will have seen the op-ed that he wrote in today's Washington Post. If you haven't read it yet, it is a powerful statement and a real reflection of how he uh, you know, came at these issues um, from his time in the White House and when I was working with him. Then candidate Obama talked about this on the campaign trail. Secretary Clinton spoke about these issues in her very first speech on human rights as Secretary of State. So for those of us who were working for them at the time, we had to think, okay, how do you take those ideas, that basic concept, that basic impulse we had that we had to do more on this and translate it into meaningful, durable progress? And for us, that meant four things partners, policy, organization, and programming. On partners, from the very early days of the administration, we were working with partners, internal partners like GLIFA, uh, the uh, LGBT advocacy group within the State Department, partners on the Hill, partners in civil society, including CGE and others. And really, these relationships were invaluable to helping us find opportunities, prioritize them, and then think through how to make the most out of them. So whether it was revising the policy for State Department employees to recognize same-sex partners, or revising passport regulations to allow for accurate representation of gender identity, we depended on sounding board, encouragement, prodding, pushing, <laughs> cajoling, uh, in order to really move forward and to go from good will to meaningful deeds. Now, of course, it's not enough to change a couple of regulations to really embed the issue of LGBT human rights into the foreign policy of the United States. And that's why work over the course of two and a half years ultimately led to the Geneva speech and on the same day to President Obama's presidential memorandum. These were meant to be a package deal, a comprehensive public articulation of why the Obama administration saw progress on human rights for LGBT people as a foreign policy objective and how we would pursue, uh, pursue it. So Hillary gives the statement, and then the president's memorandum turns that into a whole of government, whole of foreign affairs approach that takes a speech and makes it an active, monitored, evaluated work plan. Every single federal agency engaged in activities abroad was directed to take into account specific goals related to LGBT human rights and their activities. So for example, uh, that memorandum ordered a whole of government approach to decriminalization of LGBT status or behavior in countries where it had been criminalized. I should note that neither the memo nor the speech was a kickoff. There was a lot of work that went into producing both of those things, including the changes to internal uh, human resources policies, changes in our national position in the UN and other multilateral organizations. In fact, six months before the Geneva speech, Secretary Clinton had sent a cable to every ambassador in the world instructing them to integrate the support for human rights of LGBT persons into their, mission, into their mission's human rights work. But, there is no doubt that the Geneva speech and the presidential memorandum laid out the rationale for pressing the progress on LGBT rights and created, most importantly, the mandate 
for the interagency to work on that objective. And that brings us to organization. If you work in government, you recognize at the end of the day, those little boxes on the org chart end up mattering because there's human beings in those boxes and what they wake up every day and think about and what they prioritize and what they do is actually what ends up happening in the world. And so the question was, how do you take an issue like this and not just make it something people nod about and say, that's a nice thing, but say, you know what? This is my job. I gotta go out there and do this. So the presidential memorandum directed the National Security Council to hold regular meetings to coordinate the development and implementation. And uh, at the State Department, Secretary Clinton basically came home and said, Look, what I have noticed around the world and what others like Michael have told me from the time going back to the transition is that there really hadn't been any consistency in what one embassy might say or do on these issues versus another. So really what this whole effort was about was not just mobilizing a global conversation, not just trying to get other people around the world to be thinking about these things, but mobilizing our own diplomatic workforce. We stood up an internal monthly meeting in the State Department that had representatives from all the regional bureaus as well as public affairs, the International Narcotics and Law Enforcement Bureau, and so on, and it was chaired by DRL, the Human Rights Bureau. Now, oftentimes when DRL calls a meeting, as Shannon knows, the regional bureaus say, well, okay, that's like way down my list of priorities. They knew from this memorandum and from the Secretary's speech and the policy guidance that she had sent out, that they not only better show up, but they've got to be able to report back in through the policy process to demonstrate how is it that our embassies and our work in the regional bureaus, not just in DRL, are actually advancing the set of priorities laid out in the speech in the presidential memorandum. And it wasn't just about implementation at that point. Then it was about ideas. It was about people starting to say, what else can we do? What are new ways that we can think about moving this forward? So one of the goals in the memorandum in the speech, um, as I mentioned, was, was to tackle the criminalization of same-sex sexual conduct. So foreign policy professionals all of a sudden had a venue to come together and kick around ideas about what do we, what do, we do about that? And, and what do we do in different places where the challenge presents itself somewhat differently? When our embassy in Colombo or Habarone had a question for how to support legal protections for LGBT people in their countries, or came up with a really good idea for a public outreach program, this became a place for those ideas to be shared and disseminated and replicated, and we saw that happen over the course of our time there. And I'll tell you, when you actually see things happening within a big, you know, crazy bureaucracy like the State Department, first you're slightly surprised, then you're incredibly energized by it. And that was the pace at which change came on this set of issues inside the State Department was something truly remarkable to behold, and that required leadership from the very top, from the President, the Vice President, and Secretary of State. And one of the key takeaways that emerged from all this is we didn't need to give tightly prescriptive instructions to our embassies. We had to give them general principles and goals and priorities, and then let them work together, both in their posts and with the department, to be innovative, and we found that that worked. And finally, programming. We recognize, partly thanks to the advice of those partners that I talked about, that sustained change on the ground was most likely to be driven by those actually advocating for progress in the communities in which they live. That's something I don't need to tell some of our next speakers who know where real change is coming from. We also learned that the civil society organizations that were working on these human rights issues were often isolated and ostracized within the civil society community in their countries, let alone within the larger uh, uh, community. And they were often small. They couldn't absorb huge grants. They needed us to change the way we did grant making so that they could do smaller, uh, that, that we were able to do smaller project-focused grants that they could actually take on board and turn into something. That was part of the thinking behind what we called the Global Equality Fund, uh, which Secretary Clinton announced in the Geneva speech. It allowed us to partner with like-minded governments like the government of the Netherlands and with the private sector and to leverage the platform of our embassies around the world to identify these actors on the ground who needed a, bu a boost, who needed a little bit uh, you know, of resources to kind of build on the work that they were doing. And then we could come forward and bolster our reporting in the annual human rights reports 
to really elevate the LGBT rights issues so that we'd have a better fact base to help our diplomats identify opportunities for progress. All of these policies and tools were informed by uh, our, I guess, contemporaneous experience with the infamous Kill the Gays Bill in Uganda. I remember sitting with Secretary Clinton in a meeting with President Museveni uh, in Uganda when she uh, went at him, I guess is the, the technical term for it in diplomatic speak, um, uh, on this issue. And he, it was, it was a remarkable conversation because uh, this is someone who was presiding over an unbelievably homophobic, mean-spirited, hate-filled legislative process that was bringing forward this bill. Um, and yet, he re revealed such a basic lack of understanding of what this issue was even all about. It was so foreign to him, the whole concept, that it actually turned more into not just advocacy, but uh, a kind of attempt at education. Now, I don't wanna say that this was just about, well, if only he knew better, then everything would be fine. I mean, there are deep-rooted prejudices that need to be worked out across the world on this issue. But it just was striking to me how it was clear not, almost nobody had probably taken the time Hillary Clinton did sitting there walking through the issue, trying to explain to him all the ways in which the world that he saw was not the world that is, and that principles and rights for LG, that relate to LGBT people were something that the United States was not going to let go of. We were not going to simply mention it and move on. We were going to stick with it. Now, uh, for a time, for a period of time, we were able to halt that bill. Um, and we learned a lot through that process, uh, through the work that the White House did, that President Obama did in his public statements, through the State Department, about how to work more effectively with local partners, about how to protect vulnerable actors, about how to engage in effective public diplomacy, and so on. And in a way, Uganda was the first concrete test of whether this commitment to LGBT rights would really matter in the face of meaningful resistance or in the face of trade-offs to other national security priorities of the United States. And I'm convinced that if it weren't for the leadership of the President and the Secretary of State, you just wouldn't have seen the mobilization that you saw, and you wouldn't have seen the steps that the U.S. was actually willing to take that put real skin in the game. So, for example, we moved a military exercise that we did with Uganda, and we had troops in Uganda at that point that were going after Joseph Kony, but we moved a military exercise to a neighboring country as one of several steps that we took to send a message, this matters to us. And it would have been hard to imagine five years earlier or 10 years earlier, the Pentagon going along with that, or for that matter, the administration saying, we're gonna do more than just jawbone on this thing, we're actually gonna do something about it. But it was leadership and it was a sense that actually we are trying to integrate and implement these policies in a way where it's not just BS, it's real, it's something that we care about. Uganda is a case worth studying because one of the hardest and most frequent challenges we run into in U.S. foreign policy is how to align our interests and our values. This challenge comes up again and again around the world. Anyone who has served in an embassy or post or worked on these issues here in Washington knows that eventually the question of, well, maybe we'll just let our values slide here because we've got something we've got to get done with this government is going to come up. And we're not always going to get it right. And, you know, frankly, to have a country that cares both about values but practices power politics, hypocrisy and inconsistency are necessarily going to play some role in our foreign policy. It's impossible to be avoided as long as you're both trying to actively do things in the world and you care about values. It's our goal to reduce the incidence of that, and it's our goal to stare that square in the face and say, how can we get better as we go forward? And what's interesting to me is to hear Rex Tillerson, the current Secretary of State, go out and say, you know what, if there's a trade-off between interests and values, it's clear to me that interests have to win, values don't win. I think that that is about as wrong-headed as it can get from the perspective of American foreign policy. For one thing, that's a sure way to undermine our interests 
in the long term as well as our values. And we can talk more about that. But more importantly, it's really just not the foreign policy any of us want for our country. I mean, we all have our qualms and our questions about the imperfections of American foreign policy, but I think we all also have an aspiration that says we're about something more than just naked self-interest. We are about a set of values. We do care about those things. We do need to integrate them. It is what sets us apart. And so this is critical to me, and I, I just want to take the last few minutes of my remarks to talk about why this work to establish and institutionalize LGBT human rights and to elevate human rights overall as a, as a, a plank of US foreign policy uh, is a purposeful and principled way to think about advancing US national security interests at their core. So one of the takeaways of the first half of the 20th century was the idea that the US could not actually be safe and secure and prosperous without being a global power that this whole notion of regional isol isolationism was ultimately unthinkable by the end of the Second World War. And foundational to the foreign policy of the United States as a global power throughout the Cold War and after has been building a rules-based global order. The idea of a rules-based global order does a few things for us. It allows us to confront shared challenges more easily it allows us to manage disputes with other countries, and it allows us to try to inculcate and expand the adoption of core universal values. We care about these things because more prosperous, more democratic, more open societies are better partners to solve the great problems of our time and are better partners to avoid the kinds of conflicts that have racked the international system for hundreds of years. And we care about rules also because they can help us provide a framework of predictability in an unpredictable and changing world. So how do you build a rules-based order that's actually durable? Well, you can't just do it by making the rules effective and predictable and technocratic. They also People have to buy into them. They have to have a sense of justice associated with them as well. These rules are only stable when they are fair. And part of what makes rules fair is that they take into account the fact that human beings are equal in dignity and rights, as the Universal Declaration of Human Rights puts it. And so in this context, it's easy to see how our work and support of, L of human rights for LGBT people and for anyone else in the world, for that matter, is part of supporting this rules-based order. International and national law, the rule of law, is more stable when human rights are respected and protected. In many places around the world, LGBT people or religious minorities or women or people of color or people with disabilities are singled out for social and legal discrimination. It is in the interest of the United States, the profound national interest of the United States, to address this kind of discrimination. It is part of a now almost century-long project of trying to build and update and protect and expand a rules-based international order. Now, the last thing I will say, even to our partners who have not made progress, <clears throat> even those who publicly espouse discriminatory or despicable policies and views, when America stands up for the principles on which we were founded and for which we have advocated around the world, it's actually an assertion of power that garners respect. America's brand, America's sense of capacity, America's attractive power to the rest of the world uh, is the brand of human dignity and freedom. And there have been different fights that have come to epitomize the quest for respect for human dignity at different times in our history. And the push against discrimination against LGBT persons is one of the fights that epitomizes that quest in the early part of this century. When we stand up for the human rights of LGBT people, we are continuing a tradition that has been upheld by Democrats and Republicans for decades. It is the tradition that the famous post-war Secretary of State, Dean Acheson, spoke often about and understood as the greatest reservoir of American power, our moral leadership in the world. So when we stand up for LGBT people, or Yazidis, or women and girls in patriarchal societies, we are asserting something about our country 
and conveying a sense of power. And even those who are still not comfortable acknowledging the humanity of every person have to recognize that when the United States acts in this way, we are acting through strength, through the strength of our values, through the strength of being able to reach so many other people around the world. You know, this is a completely different context, but it strikes me in this one. Lee Kuan Yew, the, um, the, the president of Singapore um, for a long time, said that, you know, the Chinese have 1.3 billion people and the Americans have the possibility of having 7 billion people working towards common ends because there is a universal quality to these things, not seen everywhere, not taken everywhere, but it's out there and we have to keep working for it. And you don't have to just take it from me. There's a reason why CSIS, a respected Washington security think tank, is hosting this meeting today. There's a reason why the Atlantic Council, a bipartisan institution committed to transatlantic security, is launching its own effort around the national security case for supporting LGBT rights. There's a reason why Senator Marco Rubio, a once and likely future Republican presidential candidate, speaks from the Senate floor to condemn the barbaric treatment of gay men in Putin's Russia. The protection of the most vulnerable is a benchmark for rule of law and equal treatment under it. The violation of their rights is a warning sign, a sign of brittle societies that can collapse or explode and disrupt the world order, often with little notice. So I've gone on long enough. What I probably should have done is look around this room and just say thank you. Thank you to everyone here who has struggled and sacrificed for progress. Thank you for everyone who has contributed thought leadership and asked the hard questions and made the hard pushes. And I'm proud to stand before you today and I'll be proud to stand beside you in the work that we all have to do together ahead. Thank you very much. Thank you to Jake for getting us started off in a terrific fashion, really embedding this conversation about LGBT human rights in a national security case. I would like to next welcome Jonathan Capehart from the Washington Post, Nicole Santamaria, um, who ran an organization in El Salvador on LGBT and transgender rights, and Eric Guattari, who is the executive director, director of the National Gay and Lesbian Human Rights Commission in Kenya to the stage. Thank you <laughs> very much for that introduction. And thank you, Nicole and Eric, for, for being here and being a part of this panel. Um, <clears throat> it's actually great to, to follow, follow Jake because he just gave us a very nice overview of what the previous administration was like. And while we got a brief sort of thumbnail of, of who you are, what I would love um, is for each of you to take a moment to tell your, briefly, as briefly as you can, because we only have 30 minutes, but um, to tell your story and in that, talk about how important it was to have the United, to have leadership from the United States, either in action or in voice, oh. to the work that you're trying to do. And I'll start with you, Nicole. Okay. Well, good morning, everybody. Uh, my name is Nicole Santa Maria. I'm from El Salvador. Uh, I flee El Salvador on April 10th, 2015. So right now I have two years, one month, and seven days living here in the United States. I was brutally attacked by a group of men uh, based for the hate against my community in El Salvador. So I would like to start saying that I'm uh, indigenous, um, intersex, because here in the United States, everybody forgets to talk about intersexuality, and I'm an intersex woman. Also, I'm a transsexual woman, and also I'm a heterosexual woman. So being all those women in one, it is mm -hmm. kind of, uh, a way to live in a country that the misogyny, the patriarchy, and all the ways that we are discriminated and marginalized, we have to struggle with. So 
I flee El Salvador because I wanted to survive. And uh, I know that many of my folks here uh, mm -hmm. who are also immigrants, as I am, because I've been forced to be an immigrant, I never wanted to be here. And it is not personal. <laughs> <laughs> I think we get it. <laughs> it, is, it is not personal, but I, I, never, I never thought to come here to this country and living here, speaking a foreign language, and try to, trying to work for the rights that, suppose, that we supposed to have it already. It is not a matter of the human rights and included the LGBTQI rights because it's supposed that we are humans because un until this moment, I don't have any tentacles, I don't have mm -hmm. a third eye, mm -hmm. you know? Mm -hmm. Sometimes I have one here and one in the back, but, <laughs> but, but I'm human. So I would like to say thank you to each person who is here, who is as, uh, with a gender diversity, a sexual orientation, orientation diverse of the heteronorm heteronormativity that also is a survivor as myself. And one of the things that I think that I can be really grateful for the past administration, it is that we had a very great ambassador at that moment who made incredible statements for LGBTQI rights and general human rights. Also, we had at that moment at the American Embassy great consuls who were aware of the terrible situation against rights of LGBTQI community and for the rest of marginalized communities. Even that those statements uh, meant criticism against the ambassador and the consuls and even threats against her life. So in that frame, I can say that I was the first, I think, and I'm, I'm going to take the risk to say that, that I was the first transgender woman who had able to get a visa. Because in the past, a transgender woman never got a visa before. And that was because the past administration for the goodwill of the consuls and the ambassador and the great courage of them. So the international view, it is very important for us in my country because funds and money, you know, arise from countries like this to my country, which is America as well. I'm from Central America. <laughs> so <laughs> we need to be aware of that, that America is a continent, and the, but United States of America can give us guidelines to uh, struggle in different ways and also to achieve different goals as we mm -hmm. did in the past. But sadly, with this new administration, we see and we are seeing back, uh, back steps mm -hmm. in and the things that we, are, we were doing. And we'll get to the current ad yeah, administration sure. in, in, in a little bit. But Eric, I saw you nodding when Nicole said, was talking about um, the importance of the statements coming out of the US Embassy in, in El Salvador. Tell your story in, in Kenya and the importance of um, if you think it was important, uh, U.S. leadership in the U.S. being vocal about LGBT rights. Um, thank you. It's an interesting time that I am here in the U.S. when the moral authority and credence of the United States is uh, a matter of uh, comedy internationally. We watch news and we laugh at what's going on in the U.S., especially your politics right now. But back to my story. Uh, <laughs> Wait, I, I just want to make sure I heard you right. Did you say laugh? Yes, we do. Okay, I just want to make sure that's what you said. <laughs> um, I was born and brought up in Kenya. When I went to law school, the first time I went to, I moved from the rural village to the capital Nairobi, um, I was astonished to learn in law school that it's a criminal offense for a man to love another man and to express themselves privately regardless of consent. And um, in my discussions with uh, professors, I learned that there was a lot of need for public education in terms of why this law needed to be changed. But then after law school, um, working in private law firms, I witnessed my friends going through uh, blackmail and extortion. 
uh, folks who are self-hating, doing irresponsible things that really go their life on the, on the drain. And so what we decided to do uh, was to come together and uh, set up an institution that would fight for legal reform, engage in legal vigilance to protect people from discrimination because of their sexual orientation and gender identity, and also engage in public education. Mm. By that time, uh, there was very low visibility, and I remember that the Americans were not very, very active uh, in, in fighting for equality. But then sometime in 2014, after Uganda had discussed and deliberated about the anti-homosexuality bill, they tried to introduce the anti-homosexuality bill in Kenya, and the punishment was uh, uh, stoning in public for foreigners who engaged in the crime of homosexuality. And that was the first time that the Americans really stepped up and they organized a meeting of all embassies from Europe and um, North America to discuss strategies of how to counter that bill in Kenya. And um, before that, it was the Norwegians and the Dutch. But then what happened is that uh, through collaboration and the soft diplomacy um, that was engaged in, the Americans leveraged the, I would call it diplomatic capital and economic capital that they have with the government of Kenya, especially top leadership in Kenya. And they also leverage the fact that Kenya has a very, very broad and progressive constitution that mirrored and shared American, American values. Uh, eventually the bill was shut down because of um, constitutional concerns that were in that bill. But another interesting thing that happened was when President Obama was coming to Kenya and the media in Kenya was very abuzz by the fact that Obama had said that he will not shy away from speaking about LGBT equality in Kenya. And what happened is that there was a lot of public conversation and discourse about LGBT persons. There were people who were threatening to have a demonstration by walking naked across the streets to show President Obama the difference between men and women and how sexual organs should be used. Um, but he did not shy away. For the first time in our country, we had the head of state in Kenya, the president of Kenya, having to take a stand on LGBT equality in the front of the lawns of the state house, discussing LGBT equality with President Obama. For the first time uh, in our history, we had the leader of the US coming to our state house and analogizing LGBT discrimination to racism in America. Mm -hmm. You know, mm -hmm. placing it from a context of dignity. Yeah. And also because he was coming for an entrepreneurship conference um, and because Kenya has been having a lot of socioeconomic anxieties in terms of development, elevating poverty, and encouraging young people to invest in business and to grow economically, he gave a very, very profound example of how uh, years ago, black people in America were being discriminated from accessing employment, from accessing healthcare, mm. from uh, accessing credit for businesses. And he gave that example and, and, and he said, when you discriminate against an LGBT person from accessing housing, when you fire them from work because of their sexual orientation, when you don't give equal treatment and equal opportunities, then you are really undermining your opportunity as a country to grow economically. You're really mm. taking your GDP down the drain and and uh, in a larger scale, you are self-defeating as a nation. So um, America's uh, duty, I'd, I call it duty, America's duty in the world to give moral leadership, to show that it is possible for people to come together, to, to really respect that dignity of every person and allow the person to be the best that they can be in the world, that right now is at stake. Um, how was President Obama received in Kenya? I mean, clearly you really appreciated what, what the then president had to say. I'm wondering how it was received on, on the streets of Nairobi in the rest of Kenya. Was it viewed as lecturing or was it viewed as coming from a place of love? It was viewed from coming from a place of love. You must understand that because of his Kenyan roots, Obama enjoys a lot of moral authority in Kenya. A lot of people look up to him as an example of the possibilities that uh, are there in life in terms of realizing and achieving your biggest dreams ever. 
And so people are really looking forward to whatever he's going to say. Um, for example, there was all radio stations and all TV stations were broadcasting live whatever he was saying. Um, the resistance that came was only from the Christian conservatives. Mm -hmm. And from the public demonstration that they had, there were around 30 people who were mm -hmm. demonstrating. Mm -hmm. So the resistance was very, very, very little. Mm -hmm. And there was a lot of love. Because what he did is that he didn't do what he did in Senegal. In Senegal, he landed and he was telling the president of Senegal that there is need to decriminalize homosexuality. When he came to Kenya, he was asked that question. It didn't come from him. He was asked whether the US is concerned about how LGBT people are treated in Kenya, in Africa in general, by a BBC journalist. And in, in response to that, he took his time, a long, long time, trying to speak about how uh, it causes injuries to dignity, how, for example, discrimination, and when it's entrenched in the law, sends a public message that these people don't deserve or belong to society, how it reduces citizenship, how it diminishes the potential of someone being an active contributor or participant in the democracy. So he really, really, really did not hinge on lecturing people on what needs to be done, but he gave examples and reflections based on the journey that America has had to get to where it is today. Mm -hmm. And Nicole, you mentioned in your, your opening remarks about how important it was for um, the US ambassador in El Salvador to be very vocal and very supportive, even in the face of, even in the face of death threats, I think you said. Um, in El Salvador, as with, as with Eric, you loved what the American ambassador had to say. But um, in the rest of El Salvador, was the were the ambassador's words seen as Ameri the United States lecturing El Salvador? Or was, were those words seen as coming from a place of respect, dignity, and love? <laughs> well, it's a very, <laughs> yeah, it's a very interesting, you know, because, you know, in my country, even that the laws are supposedly be secular and it is not supposed to be a religion country, it is at the same time very religion country. So our laws are based in the moral ethics that the religion marks. So the words of the American embassy through a Mari Carmen Aponte ambassador at that point, they weren't take very good, mm -hmm. actually. And every time that, every time that this kind of a statement went out or when spoken out, that meant three or four transgender women killed on the street. Mm. So in El Salvador, death is real. Basically, every day are 35 murders per day so if you are women, if you are poor, if you are LGBTQI, if you have any human difference conditions that the rest of the majority, you are in a high risk to be killed. With no recourse. With no, we don't have that, yeah. <laughs> you don't. So I think that one of the important thing in a very corrupted country as is mine, it is that the money that the United States can invest in security, you know. One of the biggest thing that I really <coughs> saw when I was here, because a month later that I arrived here, a friend, a sister, a coworker was murdered. Uh, she worked with me at the Colectivo Alejandria, the, the Colectivo that we found. And um, if the Inter-American Commission of Human Rights didn't make an, a statement and practically order to the state of El Salvador to uh, speak out for this human rights murder, El Salvador don't do nothing. So I think the accountability of our countries, it is also based in the international view. And in the international view, it is really important 
to make the laws or the policies because we don't have any kind of law to protect us. We don't have gender identity law, we don't have an anti-discrimination law, we don't have really a hate crimes law. So we are basically thriving in nothing. So those statements are not good in our country because it is like a, the jungle, you know. So it sounds like in, in Kenya, President Obama's words were, um, were profound and powerful and helpful. And as, as wonderful as it was to hear someone of authority on the international stage speaking out on behalf of the LGBTQI community in El Salvador, it was a double-edged yeah. double sword. Um, Eric, you uh, said a moment ago that America's, the United States moral authority is, uh, what was the word you used? Uh, uh, withering away, drying up, no longer there. Uh, but it leads to, we have to talk about, I know, I think the next panel is talking about the, the current administration, mm -hmm. but we can't talk about um, the Obama administration and, and the power of its example and the seriousness with which it took uh, LGBT uh, issues and not talk about what, and correct me if I'm wrong, is a, an overnight change in America's role when it comes to LGBT issues. And so I would love for you, Eric, to talk a little bit more about this diminishing United States moral authority as it relates to your life and what you see in Kenya? Um, well, I said it's at stake. Um, the reason for that is, and this is an outsider's perspective for someone who's not an American and who lives uh, in Kenya. Uh, what we see is a very consistent undermining of constitutionalism, of the rule of law, uh, a very good example of bullying, of insulting others, of getting away with the most um, indignified behavior towards others. What this does is that it changes the perspective of not only citizens, but the leaders in our countries of what it means to be a good democracy. It changes and, and it encourages bully presidents like Museveni and Magufuli in Tanzania now to know that they can get away with anything that they want to do, especially towards minorities who enjoy no legal protection under the law, like Nicole speaking about El Salvador. So this, and, and, and it's not really a duty that America needs to uh, constantly embrace. Maybe it's time mm -hmm. that some other uh, leadership in the world emerged, but this is concerning because it really, really presents a shift in um, not only how democracy is viewed, but how we view human dignity across the world. In, in illustration, for example, when America decided to cut funding for reproductive health programs, uh, and that was very closely tied to MSM programs and to programs that really protect LGBT persons uh, in Africa, what that meant to a lot of people was that this, this new administration has no regard for, for women, for mm -hmm. LGBT persons, for refugees, for persons who are facing religious discrimination. And the only thing that is now being identified with American policy is brute force. You know, go bomb Somalia, go bomb, mm -hmm. like use your military, but you're not using your moral authority in the world. You're abdicating that role. And that is very concerning because right now what we see is that we need to step up and fight more for ourselves, knowing that the allies that we had have shifted their allegiances or their mm. interests because they're more interested in mullah, money, mm. and, uh, and, and, in, and entrenching global capitalism at the expense of human dignity and those values that have brought mm. us together as a globe to see ourselves in each other. So that's why I'm saying it's at stake and it's concerning mm -hmm. 
And though we laugh about it, it comes from a point of really, really great concern because it's not just LGBT persons mm -hmm. who are affected by this. There are a lot of young girls who need to be protected from FGM exactly. and early marriages. And once that happens to them, the economic potential in future is diminished. So mm -hmm. it's a really mm -hmm. larger scale of concern. Yeah. Nicole, I, mean, I don't. You you can't see um, what I see in Nicole's eyes, which, as Eric was speaking, Nicole was um, tearing up a bit. Ta talk about uh, expand on what Eric was talking about. Yeah, one of the things that I always say is that we have a saying in my in in Spanish, and. Um, it is basically that you cannot pretend to clean other houses if your own house is dirty. So for me, for example, seeing the LGBTQI issue, it is not like a, a struggle, an apart struggle, you know. You must see like a whole struggle, a women struggle, a gender struggle, a gender-based violence, the misogyny, the patriarchy, the white male heterosexual privilege. So it is, it is everything, you know, it, that you must to be aware for all the different tentacles that these, our struggles are. And for example, if we have a still, if, if we are a, a still struggling with that, my God, I, if we're still discussing that if I can use the, a public restroom, please give me a break. <laughs> so if we are continue f struggling in this issue here in United States, imagine the impact in our countries. So, but it is not an isolated mm -hmm. issue. It is not like, a, oh, based on gen uh, uh, gender identity, ba based on gender expression or based on sexual orientation because we need to embrace all the communities and we need to embrace all the populations for the LGBTQI and plus, because it, this is a letter soup, you know. But uh, <laughs> yeah, but we need to continue and visibilize each one of our populations to don't let nobody behind, no matter the color of our skins, no matter this, the, the, our origins, because right now I can see this issue in a point like a, in a balcony state. And when you are in a balcony, you are seeing, because I'm not in, in El Salvador anymore, but I can see the impact that comes from this country to the rest of Latin America. And there are still continue happening. And now I can see the violence that are still happening here against LGBTQI community here in the United States. I've been living here for two years, and I also suffer harassment here. And I also suffer discrimination here. So if we are trying to give the guidelines for the rest of the world, or at least in the same continent that is America, we need to start to begin with our own home and also be aware of our own privileges. Because if we are not aware of our privileges, we are not aware of the impact that we can have in others, and we can be the same oppressors that, or the same harm that we are oppressing us. I was going to ask another question, but with that answer, I think we'll just leave it right there. Nicole, Seth Marini, Eric um, Guitari, thank you very much thank for you. coming in and being here. Thank you. ...of the program. You all have the bios of our panelists on the handout, so I'll very briefly introduce them. To my left is Masha Gessen. She's a Russian and American journalist, author, and activist who has been an outspoken advocate for LGBT rights. She helped found the Pink Triangle campaign and has written extensively on LGBT rights. To her left is Manander Gill, who is the director for the Social, Urban, Rural, and Resilience Global Practice at the World Bank Group. In this position, he leads the practice's engagement on social development, which is an increasingly important part of the bank group's work in inclusive and sustainable development. To my right is Alex Wagner, who was a political appointee in the Department of Defense for nearly seven years during the Obama administration. In his last position, he was the chief of staff to the 22nd Secretary of the Army. And then to his right, we're very fortunate to have Jim Colby, 
who currently serves as a, tra a senior transatlantic fellow for the German Marshall Fund, as well as a co-chair for the Modernizing Foreign Assistance Network, MFAN. Previously, as many of you know, he served in the United States House of Representatives for 22 years, representing Arizona from 1985 to 2007. So we have a terrific panel representing many different perspectives to discuss the economic and security dimensions of LGBT rights. So Basha, we're gonna start with you. Um, in the morning segment, a lot of the speakers talked about sort of the um, dissolution of the international world order and the fact that there is this trend of resurgent authoritarianism. I was hoping you could talk to us a little bit about how you think democratic countries could push back against liberal actors who are trying to spread repressive laws, including on LGBT rights, under the guise of cultural protection and sovereignty. Um, so let's, let's just talk terms for a second. We're not talking about resurgent authoritarianism. Resurgent authoritarianism wouldn't be a problem, right? Authoritarianism is the kind of regime that leaves people basically alone to live their private lives. What we're talking about is resurgent autocracy, um, which, which is a quite different phenomenon. And um, the actors, that you, the liberal actors that you refer to, you know, they're governments. Uh, they're uh, the anti-gay policies in the countries that uh, we're talking about are increasingly coming from the government, right? So um, uh, I'll talk about Russia, which is the country I know best. Uh, and I'll give you an example of how that works for an individual, right? Because we're actually talking about uh, individuals. We're not talking about an abstract concept of, 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 of LGBT rights, right? So suppose you are a gay man in Chechnya, and suppose you have been lucky enough to not have been rounded up in the latest raids, and you, you realize that you need to get out of Chechnya as fast as possible. But the first problem you are going to encounter is the problem of trust. Who is going to get you out of Chechnya? Who can you trust to disclose who you are and why you need to get out? And where are you going to land when you leave Chechnya? Right? So suppose somebody, you're, again, you're lucky, somebody from Moscow tells you, I'm going to put you in a safe house in Moscow. Would you mind rooming with other men who have fled Chechnya. You do mind, because there's the trust issue, and you may be betrayed to, to somebody else. Uh, so the activists in Moscow are uh, stuck finding a place for you that's separate from anybody else, and you are you, fearing for your life. You land in Moscow, you, uh, and now, after a few weeks in Moscow, you realize that you're stuck, because you can't go out, it's unsafe for you, because uh, not only are you gay, but you're also darker than most Russians <coughs> in Moscow, and you're a Muslim, and identifiably so. So, uh, so you can't go outside, uh, but if your relatives from Chechnya find out where you are, you're a sitting duck there in Moscow. You need to leave the country, right? I remind you that Chechnya is a part of Russia. Uh, you need to leave the country, but you have no place to go. No country is going to issue you uh, a refugee visa, and the most common uh, way for LGBT, uh, people fleeing LGBT, LGBT uh, persecution to land in this country is to come here on a tourist <laughs> visa uh, and seek asylum. But did I mention that you're a Muslim? Uh, and, and that's, you can even seek a tourist visa e only if you're lucky enough to have a passport. If you don't have a passport, you have to go back to Chechnya, the place you fled, to get your passport. Right? I'm running through all of this because I want, to, I want us to be clear about what we're talking about. We're not talking about abstract concepts, right? We're talking about individual people and the problems that they encounter. And the problems that they encounter are problems of a hostile government. And what's happened in the last months is that the number of hostile governments has increased. And the hopes of finding a safe haven in the world have decreased. There isn't a place in the world for somebody who is facing an anti a government driven anti gay campaign uh, around the world to think of as, a you know, as the beacon of hope, as the place where they can go and seek safety. 
And that's what we really need to focus on. We need to focus on a way to provide people who are facing danger in their countries to, uh, with, with, with a place where they can go and, and an intelligible way of getting there. And Manager, I wanted to turn to you next because we've been talking a bit this morning about the economic and security benefits. And the World Bank has looked very closely at the data when it comes to the economic benefits. So I was hoping you could talk about what you have found in terms of the economic benefits of ensuring diversity and inclusion, or the flip of that, which is how is exclusionary action harmful to economies? Thanks, Shannon. So great pleasure to be here. So at the World Bank, we this is a new agenda for us. Only in the last four or five years, <clears throat> we really started focusing on SOGI issues and LGBTI issues. So it's a new issue, and often we are asked, why is, why is this a development issue? And we get that question a lot from various ministers who are our main counterparts, ministers of finance. And for us, um, we approach this agenda through the perspective of social inclusion and gender identities. And inclusion is both, it's, it has intrinsic value, because you know, it's like it's a human right. You, you should not be excluding sections of populations from the economy, from society, from various kinds of activities. But it also has an important instrumental value, because again, if you are denying or depriving chunks of population from access to education, health, economic opportunities, employment, uh, you are going to have suboptimal outcomes. In a, in a healthy, well-functioning, uh, productive economy, you want to make sure that people with the best skills, the best abilities, are able to give their best to contribute to the economy. And for LGBTI groups, that's not often the case. Regardless of their intrinsic abilities, their skills, their drive, their motivation, there is explicit exclusion and denial of access to at multiple levels, uh, denial of even safe existence within a family, which is a very unique form of exclusion. Often, if you are a minority, if you are, if you have physical disability, if you are an indigenous group, most excluded people do have some safe havens within the family, within a school, with friends. What makes LGBTI groups unique unfortunately in some cases is that even your own family, your own relatives, your own friends are not a safe space for you. So imagine someone trying to get an education, get access to health, get a job, and make it in life with all those uh, huge disadvantages. Um, and therefore, you know, we believe that if we are, if economies are to do their best to prosper, to thrive, there is, uh, we absolutely need to make sure that everyone, including LGBTI groups, they make a contribution to the best of their abilities to the economy. The other question we get is, uh, and we get back <coughs> surprisingly a lot, is how many people are we talking about? I mean, in many countries we get the question, uh, well, we don't have that issue here. This must be in some countries, but we don't have any gay people in our country. So we do get that. Uh, or much more often we get the question, how many people are we talking about? You know, is it 0.01%? Uh, so one, it's not a question of numbers. Two, the numbers are in Sao Paulo, uh, even I was surprised, Sao Paulo, 16% of population of Sao Paulo, which is a huge metropolis, identifies itself as gay or lesbian. That's a, that's a huge number. And yes, it's a city, and you can say that that's a safer space. So many people from rural areas of Brazil may come to Sao Paulo because they feel that they have a better chance of making it as a gay person or as a lesbian. But still, it's a, you know, that's, a, that's a remarkably large number. Um, but what we do need is more data. So you would expect an organization like the World Bank to have the data at their fingertips, and unfortunately we don't, but fortunately we are embarking on a major effort now um, to get 
the best possible data on numbers and on the cost of exclusion, uh, because all the concepts I just mentioned, we do get asked, so what does it mean in terms of percentage of GDP? Are we talking of 0.01%? Maybe we can, we can deal with that. But uh, wherever we have looked, um, sort of uh, not in a very rigorous manner because data is hard to get, but our sense is that the impact on the economy, direct impact, and also the, the, the spin-off uh, or the, you know, the, the knock-on effect of exclusion of certain groups on the wider economy is actually much higher than, the, than, the, than what the LGBTI folks may be experiencing themselves. So we do have this major initiative to get better data. And with that data, we hope to make a stronger case for policies, <coughs> programs that bring LGBTI inclusion center stage as part of the development process. As you know, the World Bank and the development community at large has this, so we have this twin goals of eliminating extreme poverty and uh, sharing prosperity, uh, which means that the bottom 40% should do better. And we have this goal by uh, 2030, we want to make a big impact on shared prosperity and we want to eliminate extreme poverty. And often we find that the poorest, some of the poorest people in developing countries are from among LGBTI groups. And in even more developed economies, they are often, because of all these multiple exclusions, you find them in the bottom 40%. So if we and the rest of the development community have to achieve those fundamental goals, um, we absolutely have to promote LGBTI inclusive development. And Alex, much like the World Bank, the Department of Defense is a huge organization with many um, pieces. I was hoping you could talk about your experience trying to shepherd a more inclusive policy for LGBT rights within the US Army, um, and whether some of the concerns about force readiness and sort of overall productivity of the US Army was um, affected in any way by the policies that DOD adopted. Uh, thanks so much, Shannon. Thanks for having me here at CSIS. It's a, it's a real honor to sit on this panel. Uh, I spent uh, just over six years at, from the beginning of the Obama administration working in the office of the Secretary of Defense. And in OSD, as it's called, we were very engaged both internationally and in the interagency. And if you ask me what the military departments did, I would have said, oh, they work on their own things and basically you know, feed information to the Joint Staff, who then represented all of them, uh, to help develop policies that the United States could then implement abroad and internally with our partners at the State Department, Homeland Security, and within the intelligence community. Essentially, I had no idea. And so I got to the Department of the Army in late 2015, and I had a blank slate. And I had to learn what the Department of the Army did. And what I didn't know, and what many of you might not know, is that the Department of the Army and the other military services are huge business organizations. The Army is the second largest employer in America, after Walmart, with 1.4 <laughs> million service members, civilians, and contractors. Uh, we have a $150 billion annual budget, and that's only the one we're actually executing. We're currently working on one with Congress, and then when I left the Army uh, earlier this year, they were working on the budget for 2019 to 2024. So this is a huge endeavor. And when I got there, one of the things we wanted to look at was how do you create a stronger, ready, and more lethal force? And when you're a big business and you're the government, you look to the private sector. And what was the private sector doing? The private sector was prioritizing diversity and inclusion not because it was important because this is the morally right thing to do, which it is. Not only because it's important because here in the private sector you want to be able to access the greatest pool of talent possible, which is important. Not only because it helps bridge an increasingly growing civilian and military divide uh, by looking at an increasing uh, demographic change in this country and making sure that the military actually reflects the people that it's trying to protect. But most importantly, 
It's because of the science of diversity. And the science of diversity, as the private sector is realizing, based on studies from UCLA and the University of Michigan, says that when you bring diverse teams together of average performers, they almost always outperform carefully selected teams of homogenous top performers. And why is that? It's because you bring people with different backgrounds and different experiences in life, and they're able to solve problems that people who have grown up a certain way, have been taught to think a certain way, have been around a certain group of people, might not have even considered. And so when you look at the Army's four-star generals, nine of them, they're all male, by the way, nine of them went to West Point, which means that from 1979 to 1982, they all were taught by the same people, and they've known each other most, if not their entire careers. So why does this all matter? Well, it matters because when the stakes are the highest, uh, and national security, in the national security world, the stakes are the highest, you want the most ready force, you want the most lethal force, and you want a force that, um, that the army is then ready to turn over the product, this business unit, turns over the product to the combatant commanders, to the Secretary of Defense, that's ready, that's well-trained, that's well-equipped, and can be deployed anywhere in the world. So what do we do in the Army, to answer your question very briefly, to, to live those values that the science said was so critical? In early 2016, uh, the Department of the Army told Secretary Carter that we would seek no exceptions to uh, ensuring women had access to all combat roles. Later that year, uh, we decided that, that we would lead in developing a manual and policies to ensure that transgender soldiers, of which there were transgender soldiers, could serve openly and work on policies uh, to advance how to assess transgender individuals into America's Army. And then finally, and I think uh, what proved ironically the most challenging, but was ultimately the most gratifying was developing policies that ensured that religious Americans who wanted to serve, whether they be Sikh, Jewish, or Muslim, wouldn't be forced to choose between articles of their faith, wearing articles of their faith, or um, grooming standards, and serving the country that they loved. And, and I thought, well, you know, you've heard a lot of criticism, and I always heard criticism. What you're doing is this is, this is social experimentation in the military. And I, I would argue, and I know, Secretary of the former Secretary of the Army, Eric Fanning, would argue that opportunity, diversity, and inclusion is not a social experiment. It's actually core American values. Mm -hmm. So uh, when you think back, the Army is a powerful symbol in, in not only reflecting America, <clears throat> but actually leading America. The Army integrated before the Civil Rights Act African Americans. The Army included women in nearly all roles and paid them equally to men before the modern women's rights movement. After Congress repealed Don't Ask, Don't Tell, uh, and the Secretary of Defense and the President and Chairman certified that repeal, I would argue that open, trans, uh, open LGB service actually paved the way to change how Americans thought about gay people which helped convince the Supreme Court and other courts uh, that marriage equality was a constitutional right. And finally, I am very optimistic that open transgender service will help people understand what it actually means to be transgender. And if the Army and the military, the most respected institution in American society can do it, then I think not only can we figure out a way to expand consciousness and rights here at home, but also in those 150 country in the world where 100,000 US Army soldiers are deployed today. That's a great segue um, to you, Mr. Colby, because of course all this is happening against a backdrop of politics. So I was hoping you could reflect on your 20 plus years in Congress and talk about why you think it's in the United States interest to protect and defend LGBT rights. Thank you, Shannon, and um, thank you all for being here today and to my fellow panelists. Uh, 
one of the organizations here in town that I uh, serve on the board of is the International Republican Institute. And last night we had our annual dinner and we honored the ladies in white from Cuba. And some, many of you may be familiar with the ladies in white. You might say, well, that's not primarily about LGBT issues. But what are the ladies in white? The ladies in white are people, women, who every Sunday march in white in the streets of Havana uh, to defend the rights of their families, their husbands, their fathers, their sons, their daughters, who have been uh, persecuted for political beliefs, some of them for being LGBT. Uh, and these women have, are arrested, they're harassed, they're fired from their jobs, and yet they come back and march every single week. And it's really quite, uh, imp not only impressive, but it makes you feel very humble when you think of these people, these women, who are just women from, the, the, from families in the, in the run of the mill, in the, in the workforce, who are doing this every single week because they're trying to protect human rights. And why, why do I mention that? Because I think what it says is that universally human rights it doesn't matter what they are. Their human rights are core values uh, for all of us. Uh, and they, they really are something that has to be protected and defended all the time. By protecting those, by what they are doing, they are also protecting our rights. And when we speak out and protect those rights, uh, we are helping them as well. Uh, these, we know that what is happening around the world uh, is, some terrible things that have been happening. We don't, we've heard about Chechnya here today, but we know also that there are children sold into slavery in, in Nigeria. There are persecutions and sham trials in, in China. And just this morning I was reading something about the untold story of, of the, the persecution of, of gays in Sri Lanka, Bosnia, and Herzegovina, a leftover from the war that was 20 years ago in the Balkans there. This is part of our core values when we're talking about human rights. Uh, and I think that's the first thing we need to understand. It's part of our very core values. And you can't separate those core values from the kinds of things we do, from the policies that we enact, whether it's policies at the executive level or policies within the, uh, uh, within the Congress. So what does the, co the President and the Congress need to be doing? What should we be doing? First of all, we need to have a, we need the, the President needs to speak out on these issues and not embrace authoritarian regimes around the world, authoritarian regimes who have been persecuting uh, LGBT people as well as, many, as well as many others, not inviting those people uh, to the White House. We need to make sure that those diplomatic missions in each of these countries are speaking out and making sure they understand this is part of, our, of the core values of this country. And Congress needs to speak out. Congress has. It's own, the president has the biggest bully pulpit, but Congress has its own bully pulpit, it's the power of the dollar. It's the appropriations that they, uh, they make available to uh, diplomatic missions, to all the uh, agencies, executive agencies of government. And, and I think we need to speak with the power of that dollar uh, and, we, and, do, and understanding that things are not always perfect in the world and they're certainly not perfectly black and white and sometimes there are national security interests that get in the way of what we would like to be doing in a perfect world on human rights. I think we understand that, but we still must not lose sight of the fact that these are the core values uh, for the United States. So Congress needs to look at this more and look at what kind of agencies are we funding and what kind of grants are these agencies giving? Where are we uh, spending our money in these, in, in these countries? What are we doing about membership uh, in, in international organizations? Do we help countries that are trying to uh, join the European Union or NATO who have a bad record on, on human rights? Do we speak out strongly enough in the United Nations against people, against countries that are on the uh, Human Rights Commission, the committee there? Uh, do, what should we, we should be speaking out on those things and we should make it clear that we are doing so because this is not just for LGBT, this is because it's part of our core values. It's in our DNA. Just as, as Freedom House, whose board I serve on, and IRI work on freedom and democracy, 
this is part of freedom and democracy, for people to be able to have these, these values and to be able to express them and to have those protected. So I think it's imperative that Congress uh, and the President together have to work on constantly renewing our commitment to this, these core values, and they do it through very practical means of what our diplomatic missions do, of who we speak to, who we meet with, where we go, what we say, and in the case of Congress, where we appropriate those dollars, what kind of agencies, and what kind of work we expect them to do. So several of you talked about the data or the science of diversity. I'm curious as to why the data is so difficult to come by, and even if you had that quantifiable information in terms of the impact of equality on security, on economics, would that help make the case or persuade hostile governments or skeptical people within the armed forces or members of Congress? Um, or is there something beyond data that would be more important in terms of really making an argument for a values-based foreign policy? Yeah. So I can just, I think, so the, you know, the value-based argument is a very strong one and we should certainly, we do make that and there are many countries around the world who are opening up, who are becoming more inclusive, providing more rights. I think the the data, so the data is not at the, it's not either or. The data argument is, uh, data helps us make a stronger case for, uh, in a way, opening the eyes of policymakers that this is not a fringe issue. Mm. So there is tremendous amount of misunderstanding about what are LGBTI issues or rights? It's, you know, I wouldn't even go into that. So uh, what we've found is that where we've been able to, so you talk to a finance minister and they say, we absolutely want to uh, leave no one behind. We want to, you know, have last mile populations served and rise above poverty line. And we, so that's as, a, as an objective, that's, that's very clear to them. Often discussions of excluded groups are always piecemeal. You talk about ethnic, or you talk about indigenous peoples, people with physical disabilities, and religious minorities, LGBTI groups. And every time the sense is that, oh, it's just one or two percent or three percent, so we're talking. So one of the things we found very effective is when you say, okay, if you add up the the obviously vulnerable groups, you know, and when you add all of them up, you're talking of 15, 20, 25, 30, or a higher proportion of your population. So how are you going to achieve the objective of eliminating poverty or leaving no one behind if, unless you do something about these populations and have policies and programs that really, you know, are accessible to them and make a difference in their lives. And that has kind of, you know, that has opened eyes among our counterparts who are ministers saying, yeah, this is, so this is a significant issue. Um, therefore, we feel that for us as an economic institution, or a, not an economic institution, I take that back, as a development institution, which is, which is people look to us for economic data and for economic rationale behind the policies that we we, you know, we, we suggest and we prescribe, it is important for us to be able to put these numbers on the table because our sense is that they are pretty persuasive and it's not a fringe issue even from a quantitative economic development aspect. Sh Shannon, I don't think data is going to change Putin's mind and get him to suddenly decide to support hu uh, LGBT rights or other human rights in Chechnya. But it's important to have that data because we need to be able to speak, if we're speaking of our core values, which is what I was talking about, if we're speaking to our core values, we need to have that data as the evidence, the support for what we're talking about. So data is extremely important, but I don't think we can overrate it in terms of how it's going to influence autocratic rulers around the world. Yeah. Yeah, I, uh, I mean, I, I'm really suspicious of data-based arguments, to be honest, because I think that, 
you know, telling a country, uh, a, 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 you know, especially telling a hostile government that it should uh, pr uh, grant people their basic human rights because it is good for the country uh, is, to me, a suspect argument, uh, and it's unsustainable. I mean, the argument is they should they should grant the uh, people basic human rights because it is the only right thing to do, right? Not because it benefits the economy, and there will always be a group uh, that uh, granting whom basic human rights does not benefit the economy, and that is not an argument against granting them uh, human rights. Well, Shannon, you, you dump data into uh, the conversation about the science of diversity, and I think at least from my perspective, the science of diversity is data-based and unequivocal. In the military, what it's doing is it's coming up against a culture that prides itself on, first and foremost, a meritocracy, uh, and second, shedding your individuality in order to serve a cause greater than yourself. Mm -hmm. But I'd say that as people start to understand that a pure meritocracy really doesn't exist because of implicit or unconscious bias, and you hear those terms bandied about a fair bit more, including by major, major American companies, and that they realize that they have to make or expand awareness of unconscious bias on the one hand. And then when the military sees how the rest of the world perceives US Army soldiers wearing a hijab or a yarmulke or a turban, and can see themselves in our military. I think that sends a powerful message to our partners around the world that we are actually living our values. And, and that helps not only their you know, chief of general staff, it helps the most junior soldier in another country's military understand why the US Army is there and what its values are and how it aligns with the policies that we're advancing. So there's demonstration effects, in other words. So the audience has been very patient in waiting um, for their turn to ask questions. We're gonna open up the floor to Q&A. When you take the mic, please introduce yourself and where you're coming from if you have an affiliation, and please keep your question to a question so that we can get in as many as possible. So Julie um, and my other colleague will bring around the mics. I saw this woman's hand first. And we can take a couple at a time um, to maximize the number. Good morning, my name is Beverly Allen and I host and produce a radio program, Practical Security, on Arlington Independent Media. You can probably guess where my question is going. Uh, can you speak to exactly what are the security dimensions of this topic? Okay. There's another woman right here. Thank you all for coming. My name is Diana Cayley. I'm an advisor of food security and monitoring evaluation and learning at Crown Agents USA here in Washington. Um, for those of us in the international development, <coughs> excuse me, and humanitarian assistance field, I'm wondering what kind of assistance do you think is most helpful for local LGBTI, LGBTQI organizations? For example, communications and PR training, small grants, administrative capacity building, or opportunities to exchange ideas and network with other organizations from different countries. Thank you. Is there one more? Oh, right Hi, um, I'm Meredith Weiss. I'm a professor of political science at SUNY Albany. Um, and in some ways, we've been um, kind of carefully skirting the current context, which is um, rather important. Um, so even in the glory days of US promotion of LGBT rights globally, which I don't think is going to be a priority at this point, we were also at the same time informally or formally exporting homophobia in all sorts of ways. So the, there's an earlier mention of Museveni's Kill the Gays bill, for instance, drafted in part by you know, US evangelicals. Um, and so it, it's never been a monochromatic scene, even, again, at the height of Hillary Clinton as Secretary of State and so forth, and really trying to press norms of inclusion and diversity. So I, I'm curious at this point, when we see real signs of backsliding within the US, um, so we can't really set any sort, sort of moral example, um, as well as um, a, a greater space, uh, Pence's recent comments are pretty much tantamount to that, for evangelical activism that may in many ways contraindicate what we otherwise tout in terms of human rights norms where you see this um, as going? In other words, what, what space is there 
for not just promoting diversity and inclusion and LGBT rights, but specifically also not exporting um, the reverse of all that. Great, so we have three questions, one on the security dimensions, um, two on what kind of assistance would be most helpful to grassroots actors, and then three, what space is there um, to promote LGBT rights, or at the very least, not to export um, bad habits? You guys can take any one that you want. <laughs> well, I'll, I'll, all right, I'll start off, I'll take, the, I'll take the second one in terms of what's, what I think is the most important in the way of, of the kind of assistance having served as chairman of the subcommittee that funds USAID and NED and a lot of the other programs that we have at the State Department and elsewhere on this. Uh, I do think that the organizations that have kind of the small um, programs are really the valuable ones. Uh, the, the programs that do gra grassroots, for example, both at Freedom House and at IRI, NDI, I should say, as well. Uh, what we are about is, is promoting the gra grassroots development. And I think that's, strengthening that in the grassroots, I think, is the, where we can be the most helpful. Uh, not often in the kinds of programs at the national level of the government, but down in the grassroots, where people can make a difference, strengthen them, give the, the kind of things that we do in a quiet way of helping the ladies in white, for example, in Cuba, of giving them the support that's needed so that they can continue their, their protests and, and support for human rights. So I'm a big believer in the kind of assistance programs that are grassroots oriented. Masha, have you seen anything in terms of grassroots um, support that seems to be effective or appreciated by actors on the ground? You know, I, I don't think it's possible to answer that question. Uh, you know, it depends on the organization. Uh, different organizations have different needs. Uh, when you talk about grassroots organizations, uh, usually you're talking about small organizations that, uh, that are trying to do specific things that are always stretched beyond capacity. Uh, and you know, they may need uh, one kind of support this month and a different kind of support the following month. Uh, one thing that, uh, that you mentioned that is sort of not always in the realm of the obvious is, is giving activists the opportunity to communicate with activists in other countries, and I think that really can't be overstressed. Just um, helping people uh, both communicate and also just leave the country for a little bit to to de-stress and uh, and, mm -hmm. to, and to and to and to to be exposed to you know, a different air, even uh, that goes a very long way toward maintaining people's sanity and ability to work. Now, Alex, on the security dimensions, can you help? Um, us tied together sort of the developments within the armed forces and greater inclusion within the armed forces and how that may or may not affect broader stability and security for our country and for the countries that we're partnering with? Well, as I said earlier, I think it's, it's a powerful message when you have an inclusive armed force deployed globally and living those values. And I think when Today, the, the South Koreans have a two-star lesbian general uh, in charge of defending and working, defending South Korea and working with them. It's not that she's there because she is a lesbian. It's there because she is one of the most qualified generals in the entire army. And, and for a culture that might not be even where the United States is today, that sends a message. I also wanted to just briefly talk about the future because I think we've been looking at what has happened in the past and we've, we've, as we look ahead, we're, we're worried. And what I can tell you is policies can change, but people don't change. The Army is a people-centric service. And what that means is that when someone is allowed to put on a uniform, up and down the chain of command, those people then see them, those people in the uniform, as their soldiers. And I just wanted to pull out a Sean Spicer-esque prop. I'm not sure if this is more Sean Spicer or more Melissa McCarthy doing Sean Spicer. But I brought with me uh, the United States Department of Defense Transgender Service in the US Military, an implementation handbook which got distributed to every commander and every service member all over the world. And I just, I couldn't get away from the message that this says, um, 
It, it says, for the commanders, in the course of your duties, you may encounter a transgender service member who wants to transition. It is important you are aware of your obligations and responsibilities with regard to the support and management of service members who are transitioning gender. You are responsible and accountable for the overall readiness of your command. You are responsible for the collective morale and welfare and good order and discipline of the unit and for fostering a command climate where all members of your command are treated with dignity and respect. And so all around the world, when there are openly transgender soldiers, sailor, sailors, airmen, and Marines living our values, it's going to be a heck of a lot harder for a commander to support a policy change from a not so friendly administration saying, have your soldier take off that uniform than it is to prevent someone, which is a lot easier, from putting on that uniform in the first place. Manager, I wonder if another take on the question yes, the um, is about, well, if, if governments, including the US government, are going to retreat from being really proactive in this space, is it possible that the IFEs and other multilateral institutions are going to step up and play a more active and more visible role, and is that a good thing? Well, I can't speak on behalf of other IFIs, but certainly in the World Bank, we plan to scale up uh, as fast as much as we can. That's a very important goal for us. Um, and otherwise, you know, we would only be seen as being lip service to the twin goals that we talk about if you are not going to push that agenda. And as I mentioned earlier, this is new for us. We got into this about five years ago. We only recently appointed our first uh, advisor on SOGI issues, uh, just a few months ago. Um, we are at, the le at a learning stage. So even you know uh, this discussion about whether data is the right argument again, because you know, the first question was on, why is this an economic issue, or what are the economic ramifications? For us to answer that question based on the rights approach, which we strongly believe in. You know, I, my work is on social development and I spend 90% of my time making human rights oriented arguments couched as, some, as, you know, as plain good policies. Uh, but for us to answer that question on what are the economic impacts of this include, exclusion without being able to talk about but without being able to quantify that, that's a, it's a tough sell for us to, to tell a finance minister who knows his country much better uh, that this is really important, trust me, because you know this is, this is good for you, good for the world. Uh, but again, we are learning in this. We are, so we, we really want to engage as many of you uh, as are interested to help us craft these messages because you know, we are not approaching this with any prior. This is, we really want to scale up, and by that, our ultimate objective is to be, to see if we are making a difference in the life of someone. If we are not, then whether we are spending five times as much, or that doesn't mean anything. And to do that, I think people in the audience and on, you know, on the panel, you can be our best advisors to help us craft the message and the work and the initiatives, how can we do something as an international development institution that does have, you know, we do have a seat on the table in many of these discussions. How can we be most effective in making a real difference in the lives of LGBTI groups? And we are absolutely open. We have no priors. We want to learn and we want to work together with everyone. Great, so we have time for another round of questions. Is there anybody from this half of the room that wants to ask the panel a question? Right here. Yeah. I'm Donatella Massai, collaborating with the IOM, the International Organization for Migration. It's kind of more general terms, the hen and the egg. Is that in this case, in general terms, is more the politics that is holding back access to right, or is civil society that is not ready? And 
thinking and rethinking, there have been moments in which a group of population have accessed their right through civil society convincing their politics. And the other way around, where politics is ahead and changing policy to, uh, let's say, allow uh, groups of people to have uh, uh, more rights. So I would like to have feedback. Okay. It's sort of the classic question of whether it's the government's job to move society in a more sort of inclusive direction, or is it society that should be dragging governments along? Um, are there other questions before we open up to the panel? Right here, and then right here. Oh, Julia, oh. you can give it to her first, so I'm sure closer, and then we'll go right Good afternoon, um, my name is Lindsay Martin. I'm from the Fairfax County Board of Supervisors. Um, so coming from a state and local government um, level, I've seen a lot of not necessarily resistance uh, to promoting and committing to protecting LGBTQ rights, but a silence, um, whether it's an inclusion in uh, discrimination statements or from bathroom bills. There are a lot of legislators who don't want to, for lack of a better word, uh, muddy their hands in the issue. So what are some, some suggestions um, that you could give to, I guess, market the, that to them and convince them that it is worth their time to pursue and be, um, take the initiative to uh, stand up and protect these rights? Okay, and then right here. Uh, Mike Masetic, human rights was a core principle of Reagan conservatism. Do you see any prospect of the current congressional majorities returning to that core principle? So essentially we have three questions about politics, um, <laughs> which is good. I mean, I think some of the questions are sort of what kind of courage or what incentives are there for political leaders um, to take the risk, I think, in being active supporters of LGBT rights, um, and whether there are prospects for that kind of leadership emerging in the current political landscape. Congressman Colby, maybe, <laughs> given your background. Well, I, I'll, I'll kind of come to the third question, I guess, last here. The first question is kind of the, very fundamental, is it, is, is it politics, is it the political system, or is it uh, civil society that's holding back advances uh, in human rights? I think it's a combination. I think both sides have to, be, have to be engaged in this. If you look historically at the evolution of these issues over time, it has not been primarily political leaders that have done it, it's been others that have brought about the changes and then political leaders have recognized the importance of, say, LGBT rights, and that they should be behind it because it's politically wise to do so. It's not only acceptable, but it's politically advantageous to do so. But, but I don't think it was largely politicians that have, have brought about these kinds of changes. But they do go hand in hand. There's no question about it. Once the civil society begins to change its attitude, you need to have government that is there to change the policies, uh, the laws that are dis discriminate, the laws that make it difficult for people to be engaged uh, in, in, their, in, their in the behavior that they need to be involved with. Uh, in term, the question on local government is, is a good one. I don't have a real a answer to it except to say that it's a, it's a progress in work. It's, you're always trying to overcome uh, the, the silence and resistance at local levels. I think it is more common at local levels to see this kind of silence or resistance. They're less probably, um, there, there's less attention being given to the fact that they may be silent on this issue. But those who are responsible for electing the citizens who elect school boards in Fairfax County or boards of supervisors should be making this an issue when this is it was in a campaign. They should be bringing it up as an issue. And lastly, Mike's question on the prospect of Congress returning to, to these core values that were expressed certainly as, as a part of Ronald Reagan's fundamental philosophy. Uh, yes, I'm hopeful. I mean, this is a 
an evolving kind of a situation, and it goes up and it goes down. We have advances and we have setbacks, but I think by and large, over the last certainly many, many years or decades, the trend has been upward and on the right track. So we may be in a period right now where we're not seeing these kinds of advances, but I do think that it's, that I'm hopeful that it will be there. And I must say there are some members of Congress on both sides of the aisle who have been ex very outspoken on this issue. And it, ironically, it may be that they sense, it may be the fact that the administration is not doing so that is causing them to come out and be more outspoken about these issues because they see the silence on the part of the administration. And so members of Congress are speaking out, people that I have not yet, had never heard from before that are speaking out on this in a way that I think is, is very encouraging. So yes, I think that uh, Congress can help to fill the vacuum that is there right now with this administration. Um, so I think I'm hopeful. And Masha, I was hoping to turn to you to talk about how this plays out in Russia and what would it take for political leaders to emerge um, and stand up with LGBTI individuals and sort of buck what is a very disturbing trend. And is there anything that outside actors can do to kind of create the space or create the incentives for them to do so? So uh, I, I, uh, there's always a problem when you ask a question about Russia in terms that are not really applicable to Russian society, right? Uh, so what, you know, what we're talking about is not a trend, right? What we're talking about is concerted government policy. Uh, and we can't really talk about political leaders emerging because uh, on this issue, because there aren't political leaders emerging on any issue because it's a retro totalitarian society at this point. It's a society that's, um, that's annihilated all opposition. Uh, so, uh, and, and, in, and in fact, the attack on uh, LGBT people is part of a much larger political crackdown and part of, a, uh, of an attack on civil society in general. So um, at least when we're talking about Russia, we're certainly not talking about a problem of societal homophobia. We are talking about government policy, right? And we're not talking about the interplay of homophobia and, 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 and government policy. We're not talking about who takes the leadership. We're simply talking about a government that has decided that there's a group of individuals, uh, there, 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 there's a group in the country who can be scapegoated, who can be targeted, and who can be uh, assaulted and killed with impunity. Are there any other remarks that panelists want to make um, as a way of closing out before? Well, I, I just briefly wanted to pick up on um, what Masha referenced, which was uh, the canary in the coal mine of cracking down on LGBT people as a warning sign. I'm channeling Mark Bromley here, a warning sign for broader cracking down on civil rights on human rights for other groups within a closed society. And I think to take a step back and think about pluralism and how social and civil society movements can work with governments, specifically in the LGBT space, I put on my, uh, my Georgetown law hat, I've been teaching the LGBT rights class there for the last seven years, and we've seen how both in specific instances, civil society, activisms, well-located insiders, government people, and sympathetic um, non-LGBT allies have all come together in two specific social movements I can think of to, to fundamentally make lasting, enduring, and critical changes. The changes how people understand what it means to be gay. And the first was in 1973 when the American Psychological Association removed um, homosexuality as a disorder from the DSM. And this was a combination with activists storming the podium at the APA's annual meeting. And insiders who happened to be gay or might have been closeted at the time, you couldn't be a member of the APA if you're homosexual because that was a mental disorder. And then I think back 
more recently to Don't Ask, Don't Tell and how that change happened. And it happened because there were insiders in Congress who were pushing. It happened because Dan Choi chained himself to the White House fence. It happened because you had a judge in San Diego uh, decide a lawsuit and issue a worldwide ban on implementation, which said to the Secretary of Defense, this is gonna go away, and it's either gonna go away from the courts telling you how to make your policy, or it's gonna go away doing it the DOD way. And I think offered that choice, everyone in the Department of Defense said, if this is going, we should do it our way, because that's the way it's gonna stick and work smoothly. So when thinking about how to change hearts and minds, when thinking about civil society and the role of politicians, I think you've got to look at a much more broader, nuanced approach to this by getting buy-in. And to conclude, I'll say, I remember when I was a law student, I spoke, to, I was interviewing Evan Wolfson, and this was in 2004 when all the anti-marriage amendments were, were up on the ballot. And he said, you know, Alex, civil rights, whether it be LGBT rights, or more broadly, um, advances in a patchwork. And very often, you have to take one step back to take two steps forward. And I think, when looking where we are in the United States today, it's gonna be very hard to take many steps back because, because this patchwork is advancing. And, and I'm not sure, as people understand what it means to be LGBTQIAA, et cetera, differently, as there are understanding changes, I think the policies will necessarily follow. So I want you to join me in thanking this um, terrific panel who has been just so insightful and really forthcoming in their analysis and their information. So please join me in thanking them. Thank you, Shannon. And last but not least, we've been very fortunate to have support from the Embassy of the Netherlands um, for this public event and for the private roundtables that preceded it. So I wanted to invite Ambassador Hendrik Schur from the Embassy to the stage to close us out. Thank you. Um, thank you very much. Thank you very much for, for having me. Um, I was able to follow the last panel. I thought it was very, very interesting. Um, today is uh, the International Day against uh, uh, homophobia and transphobia. I can tell you, last year on this day, I was wearing a pink shirt and a t-shirt actually, and uh, was standing on a float. Um, I can tell you I feel slightly more comfortable here. Uh, I'm wearing the rainbow pin, uh, but I can tell you I'm glad to be uh, not in a pink t-shirt, and I can tell you you are glad to not see me in a pink t-shirt. So I think for everybody concerned, this is a much better solution. But although I'm not wearing a pink t-shirt, I can tell you our resolve, my resolve, the resolve of my government for um, the support of the LGBT com community and the, the knowledge that we are not there in the long shot uh, is still there. So my pin sim uh, signifies that. While um, pre -pre uh, preparing for this, I, I'm very much of the opinion that if you want to um, t tell something about the world outside, um, you have to start looking at yourself. So I said, okay, well, you know what? We are a tolerant country. If you look at all the statistics, uh, you will see that we are very high up on the pecking order on LGBT rights. We were the first country uh, to have gay marriages, and we're doing very, very well in the statistics. But what is it now in reality? And I can tell you, even in a country, a tolerant country in the Netherlands, which you all think, okay, this is, this is it, the statistics are still shocking. I looked at the statistics for youth, for young people. 50% um, of our young people in the Netherlands who are LGBT have, at a moment in their life, contemplated suicide. 
uh, among transgenders, that's 70 percent. 20 percent have actually attempted suicide. I'm a father of four. I cannot imagine anything worse in my life than if one of my children would be just in that situation. Uh, and I think that um, of you who are in that same situation, I think you will feel exactly the same. And the fact is that that situation has been made because not because these youngsters are bad people, are worse than what we are, but we have basically, we have created taboos. We have created a, a, a world where they feel guilty, they feel not accepted. Uh, the fact is that they have bought into what we have told them that they are, uh, and not uh, because they are inherently bad or whatever. So we are, for a large part, to blame to what they are feeling. And I think that that situation is still going on. That situation is still going on in a subtle way in the workplace, uh, where we still have to be more vigilant on how we treat other people. The situation is going on very openly. You have talked about Chechnya. It's incredible it, at this moment that uh, in Chechnya, LGBT people, gay people, are basically being pick, picked up from the street. And it's not only incredible that they are picked up, but even more incredible it is that that situation is condoned, even approved, even propagated by local authorities. That, as a European, brings me back to the worst days of European history. Uh, and there is, there is a distinct similarity uh, there, and we have to be extra vigilant for it. If we do not speak up against these kind of practices, something will happen. And what you said about a canary in the coal mine, yes. Uh, there is a trend at the moment in the world going on where I think everybody who is not in agreement with that trend, and I hope that everybody is not in agreement with that trend, has a duty to speak up. And therefore, we are very happy to be able to participate in a conference like, like this. We think that LGBT, the fact that there is a, a day, a national day, international day against homophobia and LGBT, we should abolish that day because there is no more uh, homophobia and there's no more feelings against anti-LGBT and I don't think that we will be there uh, anytime soon. So that's why uh, my government, uh, the Netherlands, uh, is supporting, my embassy uh, is supporting a conversation uh, like this where you can talk about LGBT from both military strategic and from, from an economic an angle. I can tell you that my government is supporting um, conversations, uh, organizations, NGOs, uh, but also talking to companies to get that responsibility going to teach them or to talk to them what their duty to society is. Some of you might know that uh, last year in uh, Montevideo, uh, the Netherlands together with Uruguay, or Uruguay together with the Netherlands, organized uh, a big conference, uh, and we created the Equal Rights uh, Coalition. I think there are now 33 uh, countries, members of the Equal Rights Coalition. I thought it was very symbolic to have it in Uruguay, in Montevideo, and not in a European place, or in the United States, there is general feelings also outside our immediate uh, uh, sphere uh, where people are worried about what's happening to LGBT. And I'm, I'm glad to say that this coalition, the, the Equal Rights Coalition, just issued its first big statement on Chechnya, uh, basically uh, uh, condemning the attacks on LGBT and speaking up and saying, you people know that the world is watching you, know that we are knowing what, what is going on there, and uh, we have to, uh, you, have to, you have to stop. Um, 
this is a longer term process. Uh, this is a longer term. I'm very happy that CSIS and uh, the Council for Global Equality has also made this a longer term project. We have pledged that I think one of the first work, working groups after this conference will be held uh, at my residence. You get good food and Heineken beers, I can, I can <laughs> promise you. Um, but most of all, uh, I think that's very important that this is a partnership. This is a partnership of you who are in this room. This is a partnership with other people, with the politicians, uh, with uh, uh, business life. Uh, uh, this is a partnership that where we will have to bring uh, a change. Uh, uh, a change uh, which I think is inevitably coming, uh, but uh, we have a, a holy procession, uh, a Catholic procession in the Netherlands uh, where uh, the procession is that you take three steps forward and two steps back. It doesn't go very, very fast, but that's why you are Catholic, so uh, you have to uh, make sure that the Lord uh, listens to you, so you do that. I think this is a little bit of the same. I think we have taken three steps forward. Uh, lately, I, I'm a bit afraid that we might be on the, on the decline uh, again, but I'm sure that in the end we will, we will get there like the procession gets there. Uh, we will get there with your help. Uh, we will get there also uh, together, uh, I can uh, assure you, uh, with the Netherlands government. For us, as was said before, uh, LGBT rights are human rights. We carry human rights in our heart. Uh, actually, it is both in our constitution as it is one of the two principles of our foreign, foreign policy. We will be with you uh, every step of the way, and hopefully, in the end, we will overcome. Thank you very much. Okay, ladies and gentlemen, that concludes our program. We're grateful for you coming out today and uh, celebrating with us, in a sense, uh, Idaho. And we look forward to further conversations about this issue down the line. So thank you very much.